And so, yeah, so we're really grateful that Richard is, is here with us today. And um, he is not only helping us, you know, all take our minds off of, uh, off these weird times. I mean, these are very strange times. Um, but he's also taking the time to educate us, you know, on the many avenues that one could pursue within the professional creative world. And we are super grateful for that, Richard. Richard is an award-winning illustrator. He is recognized by the Society of Illustrators LA, uh, Creative Quarterly, and 3x3, and more. Uh, Maybe even, I think, some international institutions as well. Teatrio is international, I believe. And today, as, as many of you have, have seen from the social media posts, Richard Goodwin will be kind of unloading an in-depth lecture on the toy industry. Uh, Richard will speak on uh, a variety of strategies that he put forth as he uh, kind of made his way up the, uh, the toy ladder. And uh, he'll also unveil some of his process uh, for composing, uh, I believe, 2D and also 3D modeling uh, concepts, refinement, um, as well as uh, intellectual property and what it takes to develop that. So uh, I see some of you already jotting your names down in the chat. Go ahead and, and, and do that so I can take a nice attendance at the end of this thing. And uh, if you have any questions as the lecture unfolds, uh, jot them down in the chat and I'll review them at the end of the of the talk and we'll proceed with a QA. and a um, do, do think of something to ask. Again, as I've said to many of you before, it's all too often that um, students attend lectures and don't ask any questions at all. Richard is here for you to help you because he's passionate about what he does and he wants people to continue to do what he does. Um, so please do think of something to ask something that hopefully benefits you and your career as artists and creatives. Um, It's, it's, uh, it's really important to take advantage of these, of these lectures. So with that said, Richard, thanks so much for being here. The zoom room is yours. Um, So you should be able to share your screen with us at any time. Cool. Okay. Well, thank you, Tony. So Tony's a pretty awesome guy as well. I've had the the pleasure of, I, I think I knew Tony, before I knew Tony, uh, so I, I had been familiar with his work, and then I had the uh, the pleasure of, uh, although brief, getting a chance to work with him and get to know him uh, and his fantastic partner and now amazing son. So it's been really fun to get to know Tony, and, and I'm happy to be here today. Um, it's a little bit of a of a kitchen sink that I think that I've become over the years. And now I really feel it. I go in a lot of different directions. So like Tony had mentioned, you know, a lot of what I'm gonna talk about today, it's gonna cover multiple industries. It's gonna be many different skill sets that kind of go into what I do. And um, hopefully this can be insightful to y'all and hopefully um, it brings up some questions. I love to talk, you know, more in depth about things. So definitely no question is too big. No question is too small. And I'm still learning. You know, I'm always a student. I think most of us would say that. I'm always trying to learn something new. So I'm always open to, um, to looking into new endeavors. Uh, I'm actually in my little like studio nook right now. So you can kind of see a few of, my, few of my things that I'm working on over here, some prototypes and some of the tools that I use. And then I've got kind of my workstation in front of me. I have a few things that I'll show uh, towards the end of the, the meeting. But, um, but I think I'll probably go to screen share now and I'll kind of go through my, uh, my presentation. So let me see if this brings up this. So can you all see that screen pretty clearly? Perfect. Yes, sir. So I'm gonna go into presentation mode. And since I'm on one screen, if you have any questions, I probably won't see them as I go through this, but I will definitely be looking for anything at the end of the presentation. So I thought about a, uh, a name for this presentation and I thought this was pretty, pretty suitable. I don't know if any of y'all have seen the fantastic film, Small Soldiers, uh, starring Tommy Lee Jones and a number of others, but um, a most muscular, gnarly, nostalgic tale. That's how I kind of look at everything that's uh, gone through my life and brought me to today. So, you know, growing up, toys were a huge part of my life. 
Um, I grew up on a, on a block in Rochester, New York, uh, in a cul-de-sac. I was a cul-de-sac kid, and I lived around a lot of kids that were older than me. And because they were older, they had much cooler toys. So I was always very fortunate to have access to any toy that my heart could desire by proxy. And uh, I was introduced to a lot of toys that were a little before my time, right? So things like Thundercats, uh, things like Masters of the Universe, things like Voltron. I still remember um, Rob Kosky was his name. He had the full Voltron. He had every, every cat. And I used to love to go over and steal that thing from him and play with it. And I would say that as time went on, I kind of got out of touch with toys. Uh, it became less of a thing of interest of mine, uh, kind of a backseat. But as I um, got a little bit further into, uh, into my career, I realized that I really wanted to get back to basics and I wanted to do something that I love, right? And I would say with toys, my first love was the 1979 Kenner Boba Fett. So some of you, if you're toy people, you may be familiar with this toy. Uh, I was given it by a cousin, uh, and it was actually another one of my cousins. It was her brother's, and she gave it to me without him knowing. So inadvertently, I had uh, participated in a theft of a toy, uh, which I still have, and I'll, I'll show it to you. Um, it's sitting next to me. Uh, he's traveled the world. He's had a lot of fun as a toy, um, but I think that this should be able to play, but these ads and, and this sort of like feeling that I got from, you know, toys and toy culture just really is something special. And that stuff is just, to me, so magical. And it gets me excited, even watching this and knowing that, you know, this is, you know, 40 or more years past the time that this commercial came out. It still gets me excited. And just the idea that as a kid, you know, you could mail in some proofs of purchase and then eventually you would get this toy that nobody else had. That was just something very exciting to me. And it always has been. And it's something that I wanted to bring to others. Uh, and that's where, you know, I feel that toys have stories. Like I told you a little bit about how I came to get this Boba Fett and how, you know, I played with Voltron across the street, the Rob. Every toy has a story. Sometimes it's just the way it looks. Sometimes it's, you know, the scuffs and all the personality that it has that it's it kind of gained over the years. And that is something that for me is, I think, the biggest driving factor, that these toys have stories. You know, there's an origin to them. They're kind of alive, although they're inanimate, right? And, you know, like I had mentioned, I think that passion should meet profession. So it's always a matter of figuring out, you know, how do I bridge the gap? How do I connect, you know, what I am passionate about and then what I want to do as a profession? How do I profit? And, you know, like I had said or say right here, you know, it's not illegal to love what makes you money, of course, unless it's illegal what you love, um, which you shouldn't love illegal things. Um, but. Uh, I think that it, it's not illegal to love what makes you money. So you should be always seeking where that kind of in that Venn diagram, uh, what's in the middle? Where does everything meet and kind of find harmony? And that's toy design for me. So my introduction to the toy industry, it was a, it was really a calculated risk. So uh, it was something that I had thought about. Uh, I started to get more interested in kind of diving into this. And I thought, well, how do I do that? You know, I don't really, I haven't, don't really know how to do 3D modeling. I don't really know how to do a lot of these things that I need, uh, but I am an illustrator. So I can illustrate. And toy design, the toy world, there's a lot of illustration in it. So uh, this is actually just a little piece of fan art that I did uh, for Toy Pizza. Uh, it's a company that's run by Jesse DeStazio, and um, and he does something called Action Figure of the Month Club. Uh, so every month, he sends out an action figure to everybody that was a part of that campaign. He's done a Kickstarter for, I think, the last three years now, and he'll continue to do that you know, into the, into the future. So I created this fan art. I posted it to social media. I tagged 
you know, the company went in it. Uh, I, I didn't uh, know Jesse personally, so I didn't tag him, but I did send it to Toy Pizza as well in a DM just to see that they got it. I just said, you know, I, I, I love what you're doing. I've been a part of uh, Action Figure of the Month Club for the last two years, and um, I'd love to contribute some illustration to y'all if you ever have a project to work on. So this is the, I actually, last night, I thought, oh, you know, I still have this message. So uh, that's Jesse's reaction to the post. And then immediately, that happened the night that I posted it, he said, do you want to do some work for the next release? He complimented me, which is always a great feeling. And I let him know, yes. So uh, he immediately set up the next steps and then the rest is history. So I immediately had my end. This was for me, you know, utilizing social media, trying to connect to people with a skill set I had so I could lead into skill sets that I may not know yet. And this led to me getting a chance to do this. So this was my first uh, digital piece that I did for Action for the Year of the Month Club. Uh, and most of everything that I do now, it's all on an iPad. I have the, um, not this newest generation or the last generation, but the generation before, and I always forget the numbers, but my iPad isn't the newest, my iPad isn't the biggest, uh, I have the smallest uh, version of it, but, um, but I do most of my work on my iPad, so it's a nice one-stop shop and studio, and, and almost everything I do is in Procreate, so I sometimes bring things into Photoshop to uh, finalize them, get them ready for print, uh, but typically I do everything in Procreate start to finish, and that's the toy to the right. And I'll tell you, when I got that box, that had my illustration on it, and then that toy inside of it, I had a feeling that I hadn't had yet, you know, in my life professionally. Uh, it's such a feeling of satisfaction when you get to see the result of, you know, taking a chance like that, and then you're doing something truly you can feel when you're doing something that's right for you professionally. And this is what that feeling was. That then led to me saying, you know, let's keep doing this. So I reached out, you know, of course, to Jesse after we finished that project and said, you let me know the second I can do another piece for you. And he said, yep, I will tell you when. And that turned into Trilo Knight. So the Trilo Knight, uh, a translucent figure, really cool little guy. Uh, and I got to really push myself a little bit further with this. I wanted to do something that was kind of reminiscent of King Conan, you know, sitting back in his throne of energy, you know, with his sword and all this. So I got to have a lot of fun with this. And, you know, like I just feel myself just clicking with the work that I'm doing. Sometimes I know we all face, you know, um, blocks with the work that we're creating. It doesn't just mesh with, you know, what our aesthetic is, what we want to be doing. But the subject was there for me. I love knights. Uh, I love toys. Everything clicks for this. And it was just absolutely a joy to work on. And in a little ways, I got to expand on the universe. So I included some skulls on the ground and, and that's actually some lore that I passed along to Jesse. And he said, okay, well, I'm gonna include this in the official story. So through visual storytelling, now that becomes canon in his universe. And that, that's just a great feeling to see. So with Jesse, you know, I continue to work with him and typically I do one or two uh, figure releases per Action Figure of the Month Club. I've done some uh, promotional work for him, but this led to other people being interested. And I thought, all right, you know, I'm going to start to reach out to some other creators that I love, you know, some other toy makers, some bootleggers. So uh, this is the Skull Berserker Z9. It's a, a toy after my heart. Uh, it's pieced together from uh, parts from uh, action people uh, or adventure people, um, uh, Stormtrooper from the Kenner line, and a few other different toys that are kind of Frankenstein together to create a new character. And this sort of thing, to me, it's so beautiful and whimsical, and, um, and it just is right up my alley. So uh, I reached out to, his name is, um, is Taryn, uh, and his company is The Plastic Geek, uh, and I said, hey, do you want to collaborate on some packaging? And he immediately said yes. And, and an interesting thing with all of these situations is there's always been payment. It's never been... Uh, well, you know, I don't really have a budget for it. Everybody that I've been doing this work for has had a budget and wants to spend money on packaging and these sorts of things, but they just don't really have a lot of people come to them you know, offering it. So he loved it. He wanted to collaborate. So we worked on creating some card art for this. And I think that it turned out, it was a lot of fun. You know, I love this piece. 
uh, in this packaging. And I have it actually in front of me here. I also got to collaborate with a smaller maker. Uh, so his name's Derek and you know, he has a line of toys that isn't released yet, but he has his prototypes. He's working on his packaging right now and he's gonna start to release these. And he has a great following. You know, all of these people have great followings. They sell out immediately on their stores. And I wanna be a part of that. You know, I wanna be a part of their success and I wanna help elevate them however I can. You know, the colorway here that I used for this piece, it's not, um, it's not exactly what the, the finished colorway will be, but you know, we'll recolor that piece and we'll use that for the packaging that they go with. Um, but just so much fun to collaborate with other creators. Um, they're really great art directors, which I, I really appreciate. You know, if any of you have done any freelance clients, sometimes can be nightmares. But these people are passionate about what they do. They love getting any kind of help and they're just very enthusiastic. Uh, there has never been negativity uh, working in the toy industry that I have experienced. It's always, always been overwhelmingly positive. So from that, you know, I can safely say the investment paid off. I was doing illustration work steadily uh, in the toy industry. And that's a really, like, I feel that that was a victory in itself. You know, there was no more to do at that point for me. I was happy, but I did want to push a little bit further. And like I said, you know, it came uh, with steady work. Uh, it created genuine relationships, trust. I was given and bestowed uh, industry secrets from people like Jesse who were open to having conversations with me. And I was allowed industry introdu introductions. So Jesse introduced me to his factory in China, uh, who I'm in communications with right now. And unfortunately with everything going on, they've really dialed back their production and their shipping. But when we come out of this, that's gonna be my facility. Uh, so I'm looking forward to getting to work with them to actually do a production run of my toy. Uh, but I was introduced to others who knew things about the industry, knew the right people, and they love the work that I'm creating. So they wanna support me. Now, like I said, positive environment. You know, you know when you're in the right place, and I know that I'm in the right place doing this. So then it turned into time for my toy, right? So I got to work on my story, my characters, it was my rules, and my money, right? I was needing to put everything up. And, um, you know, of course, I want to pay the people that work for me. I want to employ creatives. I want to elevate their careers, and I want them to be excited about what they do. And I've always been a big supporter of that. So I needed to develop uh, my story, my characters, uh, and really run with those. So this led me to this character. So on the right, you can see uh, like a simple kind of explorative comic that I did. Uh, just a few panels. I just wanted to kind of have it be a mood piece. It didn't need to necessarily turn into anything specific, but I came up with a character. I was doing a lot of uh, helmed characters and figures, you know, muscular, kind of uh, also a bit ambiguous, influenced by a number of different artists and motifs. Um, but a lot of culture is in there for me and things that I love are included in this. So uh, I developed this character a little bit further. And on the left, you can kind of see the line art that I went with uh, ultimately for who I call Memphis. Uh, so Striker Memphis. Uh, and he's actually, Memphis comes from the Memphis School of Design, which is a type of graphic design. So if you look up Memphis, um, the Memphis School, you'll actually see that it's a lot of those kind of um, Saved by the Bell um, graphics. It's a lot of those lightning bolts and geometric shapes and bright colors. And that's something I love, so I want to incorporate that in my work. And that is where his name comes from, not the city. So things like uh, Ultraman. Uh, things like um, tokusatsu, uh, so like rubber suit shows, uh, so like Power Rangers and Kamen Rider, all these things I love, uh, Gundam. Um, so you can see, you know, I have the V-fin on his head. So like with most mecha and, and robot design, you see V-fins on head. There's little motifs that I want to pull over to my work that are nods to things that exist that gets people more invested in what you're doing because there's a level of familiarity with it. So that was part of my intention with that design. I don't want to come up with something that would turn people off. I want there to be a base of collectors for it. So I ran with my influences. I put my passion into the character. Um, and then I surrounded myself with people that are smarter than me. And, and that's, I think, one of the most important things that you'll kind of face in life. Um, I was browsing Instagram and I wanted to make sure that I was connecting with people that could potentially you know, help me with the project 
And it was actually really serendipitous. I ended up uh, getting on Instagram one day uh, and that was the day that I think I had officially decided, like I have the money to pay somebody, uh, I'm ready to make that leap. And I found Frank uh, and uh, his Skeletor piece on the far or the top right popped up in my feed. And I immediately went to his page I scrolled down a little bit and I saw that he actually was working on a toy design and I loved his silhouettes. I loved the way that he was handling these. I did a little bit more research on Frank. I saw his portfolio. I saw that he kind of was just getting into this as well. He was new to it. And I reached out to him and I said, Frank, I love what you're doing. Uh, I think that you would be perfect for this project. Do you want to do it? Uh, he said that he would write me up a uh, contract, uh, a scope of work is what he called it. Uh, he provided that to me and then we started working together and it has been a joy working with Frank uh, and you know having the ability to pay him for this work uh, fairly is a great feeling as well you know knowing that you are elevating another person uh, who is a creative and still you're profiting uh, it's a great feeling I had to think about you know my platform so kind of going into the nuts and bolts of, of how I approached this, you know, I had to think about my platform. How is I going to do this? Um, I utilized uh, Squarespace as my platform. You know, I had my portfolio site there. Uh, this is going to be true for many of you. You have your portfolio sites. Some of them are going to give you the ability to uh, create storefronts there. So you might not need to create something new. You may be able to use what you already have and expand on it. So did a little bit of research. I saw Squarespace would probably be the best option for me. Uh, so I uh, upgraded my account with Squarespace and I wanted to utilize that to do my sales. So that's where my store would uh, exist. Uh, I had to think about promotion. You know, how was I going to get this out to people? How was I going to get the word out? How was I going to build, you know, my fan base? So I'm an unknown. So I need to find those people that will invest in me uh, as an unknown. And fortunately for me, you know, and for anybody in the toy business, uh, collectors love to collect. So when they see something new and it looks cool, that's all they need. You know, they, you don't need to be an established name. You need something that looks cool. That is what's important with toys. Uh, so they wanted that and then they saw that it was collectible. So I knew that I could promote through Instagram. I knew that I could use that and lean on it as my main source of promotion. So that is what I did. I've leaned into Instagram, I've connected with the community, I genuinely interact with everybody you know, in it, I respond to every message, I have conversations. That builds that trust and that investment, that customer loyalty that has turned into sales for me. Uh, I wanna offer something exclusive, so limited runs of things, special colorways, things that get people excited. So, uh, you know, that's again, <coughs> in the, pardon me, in the uh, collectibles industry and in the toy business, People are always chasing that thing that they can't have. So offering people something that's unique, offering something uh, that is uh, above average, uh, something exceptional and something that's in limited supply. And then I needed to understand, you know, of course, for any of you as well, if you're interested in the toy business specifically, you have to understand scale and articulation. So I had to think about, well, what kind of scale am I going to do this in? Is it going to be 1 18th, 1 12th, 1 16th, or that should say uh, 1 6th. I don't know how it ended up 1 16th, but uh, that's the 12 inch scale. So you have your 12 inch scale, six inch scale, and, and three and three quarters inch scale. And each of those type of collector is different. They're each looking for something different. And what I did was uh, to start, and I'll kind of go into this a little bit more in a moment, I released options for each of these scales uh, that I was interested in releasing in, which for me was three and three quarters and six inches. Uh, I gave people the option of either. And then I got to do a little bit of research on, well, what were people buying? You know, what were people interested in? Uh, and it turned out people were interested in the one eighteenth or the three and three quarters inch scale. So I decided to limit what I release for the six inch scale and really focus on the three and three quarters because that's where people were excited. That's where there was a demand. So then I had to think about what am I using, you know, to do this? How am I producing these figures? How am I getting started with models and, and production? Uh, so that led me to research on 3D printers. Uh, I wanted a resin printer. This is something that I've wanted to do for many years. And, and one of the things that stopped me from getting into it was the uh, price of entry was too high. So getting a 3D printer was unattainable for me about five years ago, but now they're extremely affordable. So 
With the anti-cumbic photon, I'm getting a resin printer that's uh, 405 nanometers uh, that it can print at, which is fantastic. You, know, you can hardly tell that it's been printed from something. Uh, the resolution of the prints is fantastic. You know, I have no issues with this. It's very easy to set up, very easy to use. So it's all about the user. Uh, and there's uh, not a bar of, uh, for entry. Uh, whereas a couple of years ago there was. So you know, for the Anycubic Photon, I paid about $230 for it. Uh, and that is extremely affordable. Resin used to also be very expensive, but now it is affordable as well. Uh, so you can get about a, a, a kilogram of, um, of resin or uh, a thousand milliliters for about 30 to $40 now, depending on where you're buying it, which that lasts a while. Um, so the Anycubic Photon, other options that you would be able to look into would be the Frozen or the Mars Elevue or the Elevue Mars. Um, and that's the Frozen Sonic Mini, but these are other options. And, and I'll be sure to share all of this information specifically with Tony uh, so that he can pass this along to everybody if you're interested in looking into creating a shopping list for yourself. All of these are affordable. Uh, all of these are easy to use. They, they follow the same principles. They use the same files. Uh, the only thing that you need to do is prepare the files for print, which that's something that I taught myself how to do. And I have taught myself to use Chitubox. Uh, so Chitubox is the slicer uh, program that I utilize uh, to prep files. Uh, like I had said, with most of these things, they're accessible. So Chitubox is free. It's very user-friendly. Uh, I just headed over to YouTube. I watched a few videos on best practices with using it, um, some very introductory tutorials. And then I felt confident in doing it myself. A little bit of experimentation, a uh, little trial and error, and I was on my way with it. And this uh, helps me with building supports, rescaling, and hollowing the model so that I can be more efficient with how much resin I'm using. So this is a screen cap from using uh, Chitubox. Uh, this is a, a print file before printing. Uh, I'm testing an orientation of the head because you can orient, you know, whatever you're printing in different ways. So I'm testing the orientation here, trying to reduce print lines and, and, and those sorts of things and increase the resolution. Uh, and this, these prints turned out fantastic. So this worked well. And, and you can play, as you see with the supports, you build those and you can, you know, set them to different uh, guidelines and specifications uh, so that the, um, what's left or the artifacts that are left on the uh, print itself are very minimal. So I've tweaked all of that and it works extremely well for me. And if any of you are interested in my settings and you are actively 3D printing or doing any of that, I also want to share that with Tony so that he can pass that along to y'all. I have screen captures of every single uh, type of setting and every single portion of the support. So you can copy those if you want. They've worked fantastically for me. And when something prints, the file that you get, you, you end up slicing it and makes sense. You know, a slice is just, you know, a, a cross section of, you know, each portion of the print as it goes up. So most prints are, you know, uh, hundreds, if not thousands of layers. Uh, and, you know, they're being exposed to UV light. So with Chitubox and other slicers, you know, you can set all of those specifications. These are the settings that I use for the resin that I use. Uh, some resins take longer exposures, some can do shorter exposures, and so on. But this is what you end up getting before you export your files uh, to a flash drive and then pop it into your printer and then hit print. And then that's as simple as that with getting things printed. So, you know, as long as you can get an STL from somebody or, or a 3D file from someone, you can put it in Chitubox, you can give it supports, and you can take it straight to your printer. And it is truly as easy as that. The only thing beyond that is figuring out how to get better at supporting your models. That's the thing, uh, to avoid failures. You know, if, if a support fails, then the model won't print entirely, or it won't print at all. So making sure that you really understand what will and won't print, that's the art of it. And there's a lot of things that you can use that will create auto supports for things, and it'll figure out that through, uh, through algorithms, through math, but those are not perfect, those are not 100%. Still, a person doing it is better than software. So there is a bit of art to that finesse. So ZBrush was the other thing, you know, of course I wanted to learn ZBrush, but that was something that I knew was a year or two away for me. I knew I could do it, 
but I didn't have the bandwidth at the time to do that. I was too focused on the character design, the comic, everything that's included in this project to really dedicate myself to it. Not a big believer in, in half-assing, you know, many things. I want to whole ass one thing, right? I think that that's a very true statement. I think that's a Ron Swanson quote from Parks and Recs. But, um, but you really want to make sure that you dedicate yourself to the things that you can and find people that are better than you for the things that you can't dedicate yourself to. So Frank, uh, he has been, like I said, fantastic. This is one of the, this is the iteration of the model uh, previous to the final iteration, but he sent this along to me. Uh, we communicate mostly through Instagram. I've actually never even spoken to Frank. No voice, just all chatting on Instagram via email. And it has been very easy, very seamless to do. So thank you, Internet, for making the world so easy and accessible. But I got this model from him. So excited to see it. You know, I really wanted to push the anatomy, push the musculature of the character and, um, and you know, still maintain the integrity of the design because the design was so different than, you know, this. But they feel the same, you know, in the same vein. Uh, so uh, Frank handles a ZBrush bit of it for me. And then, you know, now things that I'm looking at moving forward, you know, for production, it doesn't make a lot of sense to be printing every single figure because a print can be upwards of six to eight hours. So if I want to print the legs, that's about six and a half hours uh, to make sure that there's no failures with it. Because what's even worse than spending six hours is spending 12 hours because it keeps failing. Uh, so making sure that, you know, it is successful, six hours for legs, I might be able to print two sets of legs per print. So you're already looking at a really slow production time. So now I'm looking at investing in a pressure pot um, and getting myself some smooth on, some umu, just some one part, you know, one to one mixes uh, for creating some, some molds for my figures and then start to cast and resin. Uh, that'll speed up the production process to an extent. Uh, and again, you know, find somebody smarter than you, find somebody better than you. I have a friend who is an expert with casting, with molding, with mold making. He works in a uh, production house here uh, in Atlanta on, um, on film and television projects. So he has the space for it. He has the bandwidth to do it. So he's volunteered actually to help, you know, get me in the, in his, in his workspace and create some molds, uh, teach me so that I can then do this at home. So one of the next steps is to create some great molds and then also uh, start to communicate with that factory uh, in China again uh, to then start to work with them. So then it's a matter of getting my master over to them so that they can create molds for it and then be using injection plastic for it so they can create metal molds for it. Uh, which is the ultimate goal is to be able to go into a production run of these figures and have that much more accessible to me. Uh, and that'll cost some money but that is the, uh, the direction that you know, I ultimately want to go in. But I can do this from home. And what's fun about you know, resin casting is that you can play with colors, you can play with effects. So whether you want to fill it with glitter, make it metallic, have it be UV reactive, have it change colors based on temperature, you can do all of those sorts of things. And that's what the toy community loves. So it's very exciting to be able to kind of play, uh, you know, Dr. Frankenstein um, and be a mad scientist coming up with combinations for resin and such. So there is a lot of fun to the art side of that. And as a creator, I think it's exciting to, to have some sort of unexpected outcomes and, and have projects take you in different directions. So going into, again, like more nuts and bolts, uh, you know, once I had figured all of this out and I had started to put everything together, I need to think about supplies, right? So uh, things that I buy on a regular basis right now uh, are, of course, resin for my printers, uh, boxes for shipping, bubble wrap to pack, uh, with poly mailers, so plastic uh, mailers that I can put everything in, uh, stickers for my brand and the project, um, bags, for the toys to actually go into inside the boxes. Uh, packing paper, just more packing supplies. I need my printer, I need paper for the printer. I need stamps, uh, and for me, stamps are on eight and a half by 11 paper, so I'm just printing from my printer and taping them on. Uh, paint, of course, for my figures, and then any tools that I need. Uh, so tools like uh, my rotary tool or my Dremel, uh, thinking about any kind of files, paint brushes, as well as recently I've picked up an airbrush. So learning how to airbrush and utilize that. 
And this is where it all started for me. You know, when we started this project with Frank, of course I needed to provide him a turnaround that he could work from when he created the model. So, you know, I had it from the front, but then I decided, well, I want to create, you know, side view, back view, and then sort of a cross section so that he could see the arm more clearly uh, or under the arm a little bit more clearly. So I went through and I did this uh, for him and this was all that he needed to, get, to run with it. And what he gave me first, was this. So he worked on just a rough block of the model and this is the first file that I got. At this point I was extremely happy with what Frank had, had done thus far. This was really quick for him. The turnaround was very fast. I think it happened the same day that I sent him the turnaround. Uh, and then I knew like this was going to be a successful project even from just seeing this. I would have been happy with this. You know, If I could put this into production I would have been fine with it. Uh, but Frank wanted to keep pushing. So he periodically sent me uh, new updated models that he was refining. I would send him revisions for anatomy, things that I was seeing that were a little bit off. I was making those revisions directly onto Photoshop, doing paint overs and providing them back to him. And then he went back and made those revisions. ZBrush is nice because it allows you to work more painterly, more like a sculptor. So he worked in that way. And as we worked through and began the project, at this point, he provided me a bust to test the printing. At this point, like everything was coming together. I had gotten my printer. I was starting the production process. I wanted to start to learn uh, and see if this was even feasible for me to do out of my home. Uh, and we ended up with this bust. This is one of the first prints that I ever made. I think this was the first print that I ever made. Uh, and it was successful. There was no failure in it. And I think that it turned out fantastic. It's up on my wall right now. Uh, this is kind of one of those fun little artifacts you have from the production process. And then we uh, wanted to go a little bit further. We wanted to see how this would play with other toys, right? So I had mentioned Jesse and Toy Pizza uh, at the beginning of the conversation. And uh, I wanted to see if my uh, heads or helms were compatible with what Jesse was creating. Uh, so we printed it to scale, so I resized it in Chitu box, and then I uh, modded it and I dremeled out sort of the neck piece so that it could uh, accommodate the ball socket that his toys had, and then popped it on and I saw, you know what, like this actually fits with his toys perfectly. Like it's designed in a way that it's not too, you know, foreign, it fits in the universe. This is something that I could sell on its own. And then I decided, okay, let's start to do this market research. Like I had mentioned before, let's start to see what the market does when I do release this. Turns out they were interested. So people had started to buy blank helms from me and also painted helms uh, in a pre-production run that I wanted to kind of, like I said, test the market, see where the interest was. What could I expect financially from people? And I was very surprised. Uh, this led to me, like I said, painting things. So I offered them in different scales. Like I had mentioned, you know, a 1 12th scale and 1 18th scale is what you see here. But I painted them all uniquely, uh, some of them in the same colorways, but they each had their own unique sort of um, elements to them. And you can see, you know, this was my opportunity to see, well, could I do this myself? You know, I love painting, I love miniatures, I love model making. It's always been something that I've done. Warhammer, Gun, Gunpla, you know, any kind of plastic models. I love to do that sort of thing and have my hands in it. So I thought, okay, I can do this. I can batch paint. And you can see on the left, some batch painting. So doing it step by step. And then you can see some more unique jobs that I did on the right um, to kind of show the, uh, the range. And people were really into that. They really enjoyed the fact that they could get something unique, something that was hand painted, and they could get it at an affordable price. And for me, that was something I wanted to offer and there was definitely an interest for it. So this led to um, bigger models, of course, and ultimately led to this first production test. So this was with a model that was not fully realized yet. Uh, and this is two, two photos, one of me working through different types of articulation. So I was playing with magnetic articulation. Um, and of course, using my trusty Dremel, uh, my rotary tool, I was able to you know, uh, cut out a portion of the resin and insert a magnet. Uh, some figures utilize magnetic articulation. Uh, and then you can see on the right, the full figure assembled. So that figure just has pegs keeping it together. But we wanted to see, like, what kind of presence does this have? You know, what does this look like in hand? What's the scale really like? You don't know until you really, you print it and you see it and you can hold it next to other figures. 
And suffice to say, we were very happy with what came out. And this was the first test. This led to more tests and some painting and some production. And with that first model that he provided, I wanted to do a paint master um, just to see how it worked. It wasn't completely fleshed out, but I thought it was good enough to paint, uh, take a few photos, put it up, see what the interest was like for that. People were excited. Um, and then, like I had mentioned, you know, UV reactive materials. I, I got some my hands on some resin that I could print with UV reactive material. Uh, and I did some helms like that. And I did a release of UV. And that was something people were, were requesting. So they wanted this. Uh, so I provided it to them, got it out, and immediately, you know, those sales were made. So, of course, the Painted Master, and I would say at this point, this isn't even a Painted Master anymore. This is something that was just a, a work in progress. Um, this is something that went over extremely well. People wanted to know when they could have it. Everybody who bought a helm wanted the full figure. And that's exciting because you know that that, uh, that smaller sale then turns into loyalty. It turns into commitment and they want the full project. So they want that figure. So again, photos promote, right? So this is where I got to take it out and play. Toys should be out in nature. You should be playing with them. So I took it out to the old trusty backyard, took a few photos, uh, did a little photo shoot, uh, much to my roommate's dismay. He didn't understand what I was doing laying down in the backyard, but, um, but that's pretty normal for our relationship and me. Uh, so took some photos, uh, of course, posing it with other figures from other makers, tagged those makers. Uh, there's some cross-pollination there. So people see that they can use my product with things they already own. And that immediately, then they think, oh, well, this is something I could do. This looks cool. Let's do it. So people were placing orders because they wanted to uh, do mix match, sort of um, Frankensteining their figures uh, and doing... Um, uh, collaborations or crossovers so you can see also you know my figure with the UV reactive helm on the right with my friend uh, Terran's uh, Skull Berserker so I finally got one in the mail he sent me you know my copy of it uh, and I wanted to have them together uh, friends or frenemies you decide so as the pro pro project went through, you know, I was getting models like this, and I want to kind of talk about everything. You know, this this is what I was, and I have this in chronological order. This is what I was experiencing play by play. So everything you're seeing, this is the order. This is the documentation of start to finish for this project, or let me say start to now because this is not finished. Uh, but this model is what he sent along. This was close to finished, but he wanted to really push the detail, push the musculature, um, push how dry the muscles were. So the striations, all of the muscle fibers. He really wanted to see what the printer could do, which I love that he did because I would have been okay with this. I would have stopped here, but he wanted to push further. He wanted to see like, let's do this until we break it. You know, let's really see if we can do it. He was excited about the project, passionate about it. Uh, and I love that and I wanted to facilitate that. So I got this, we kept moving forward with it. And this led us to a more refined model, which unfortunately I don't have a photo of the most up-to-date 3D model from him. Uh, I'm waiting for him to composite it so I can use it for promo. But, um, but this is the final model. So this is a print. This actually, it, this is really cool that I'm, I'm sharing all this because this actually happened last week. So the, about the beginning of last week, Monday, I started printing this. I finished printing the full figure on, I think, Tuesday. I lost a lot of sleep this week. Uh, so I have been all over the place. I've slept on the couch for, I think, three nights because I'm running my printer overnight uh, and I, I can't be around it and I'm an idiot and I keep it in my bedroom with the window open. Um, so uh, th these sorts of things, you know, you make these sacrifices for your passion and for your, your pursuits. So. I've been sleeping on the couch because of my 3D printer, and this is what we ended up with. I was blown away. You know, seeing this put together, uh, getting this in front of me, it's so exciting to see something that you drew turn into something that people can hold, and then one day people can play with and can display on their shelves with toys that I know, that I love. You know, seeing my guy next to somebody else's Boba Fett that they've had since they were a kid, Talk about, you know, choke up and, and be sad and happy at the same time. That's the goal for me. You know, I want to see that. I want to see how my toy plays with others. And I primed it and started to paint the helm and then did a comparison shot. Uh, this is what went up onto social media and onto my store. 
uh, when I wanted to start to make sales for this and pre take pre-orders. So you can see how the figure evolved from that initial model to the final. So taller, more definition in the musculature, um, some of the grooves are a little deeper, a little wider. These are all the little things we wanted to tweak and we wouldn't have really known to do these things unless we tested the prints. You know, the 3D model looked good, but you know, the print is always gonna be a little bit different than that because the printer can only do so much. So we really got there. We were really happy that the veins showed up and you know, we we're in the end, extremely happy with the end result. Uh, and this is something that like, definitely cried a little bit when I finally had this in front of me and I was like, I can finally put this on the store. And that leads me to, again, my storefront. So like I mentioned earlier, utilizing Squarespace, um, this is where, you know, I post all of my, uh, all of my things that you can buy. Um, so uh, Striker Memphis went up for pre-order. Uh, I had placed them at a $45 price point, $5 shipping. So every time a transaction comes through, that's $50 to me. A very small portion of it goes to Squarespace for, um, for processing fees um, and using their platform. And then I can get that produced and out to people. So some of you might be thinking, okay, well, that's all well and good. But uh, what kind of money are you getting for this? You know, what, what, is, what does that look like? you know, this, show me the money, right? You want to see that because it's all well and good to talk about, you know, passion projects and such, but is it something that can support you? And the answer is, this is just a very small portion of my screen uh, and it scrolls for a while. So I released an initial run of 30 of these figures because it's what I can do sustainably. Like I can, in good faith, I can produce 30 of these figures in the next month and send them out to all of the purchasers and not feel like, um, you know, I am uh, taking their money and not providing that product to them quickly enough. So I gave everybody a three to four week estimated time for delivery. You know, these are handmade. I'm taking some custom orders, uh, but you know, the orders poured in. And I think that right now I have about five more that are for sale. Uh, so you can do the math there. That's the money I made in about an in, in evening uh, of pre-sales. So it is something that can support your income. And let me tell you, I have a small audience that's interested in what I'm doing. So that then uh, brings to question, if I had an audience of a thousand people who wanted to buy this, then that starts to become an extremely lucrative uh, venture. Like that's a venture to the extent that I can leave my day job and just make toys. And I think that's all of our desires, you know, in life to leave our day job so that we can do that one thing that we are passionate about. And, you know, of course, for me, I'm an educator by heart. So I want to always be within the field of education and, and be helping others. Uh, so this will always be a supplemental thing for me. But I'm extremely happy with the result of it. And this money that I'm making from this then goes straight back into the project. So it's great to see the money, you know, come in, but I look at this as a way that I can invest in myself. I can make the project a little bigger. I can make the project a little better and I can offer cooler things. And hopefully one day another company will come along and say, Hey, you've done some really awesome stuff and we want you to do something for us, or we want to collaborate with you on something. I can't wait until Mattel comes to me. Uh, and Frank and says, do a new Masters of the Universe character, do a new figure. Um, I can't wait until Super 7 or 1000 Toys. And, and these are, you know, companies that I love come to me and say, you know, let's do a collaboration. Or I can't wait until I can reach out to them and say, what do you think? Do you want to work together on something? I would love to do that. Uh, because the toy industry is inherently a very collaborative space. And with IP, uh, intellectual property, anything that you own, any ideas you own, uh, of course those get licensed. Uh, and in most cases you see that either one company or multiple companies are going to be juggling a license or all have the license simultaneously, um, depending on exclusivity rights or not. So there's a chance that you can really uh, go into spaces that you didn't think that you would otherwise. And that to me is you know, where everything is leading. 
uh, so what's next, you know, with everything that I'm doing, you know, what's next? And, and Tony had said, you know, I would talk a little bit about IP and IP is a big part and the intellectual property bit of this is a huge piece of it. I mean, this is a line of toys. It's a new character that I'm introducing into, you know, the creative space. And that leads me to my comic, right? So something I love about Masters of the Universe, so He-Man, uh, if any of you are, you know, old enough or, or know this, um, figures came with mini comics. And those mini comics were really cool. Uh, they were just, there's such a sweet, sweet nostalgic space for those mini comics for me. And I want every single one of my figures to come with a mini comic. So I'm building that universe through the storytelling because how do you get somebody invested in what you're creating? You get them invested in it through storytelling, right? They need to know the character. They need to love the character. So what better way than to have mini comics that expand on those characters? So each figure that I released this year will come with a mini comic that expands a little bit on their story, gives them a little bit of a personality that they can then, you know, fall in love with. Maybe they won't, maybe they'll love to hate them. I don't care as long as they're invested in some way in the character. So the mini comics will come with them. So I'm going to expand on that. And I don't want to be the only person to make these mini comics. I'm collaborative by nature. I want to give other artists opportunities. I've already contracted two illustrators to work on two more comics for new characters that have yet to be announced. So I've already penned, the, penned those, uh, those contracts with them. They're already starting to work on them. I want to give them creative freedom to contribute to this universe. And I want for their fans, because I chose these people very strategically, I want their fans to want to come over and be my fans. So this is a great way for me to give them an opportunity, pay them fairly, and then also inherit some of their fans. Uh, that's a great way for you, you know, as somebody who's young or going into a field uh, or going into a new field to really propel yourself into notoriety. You know, work with others who might have bigger audiences, work with others who may have more experience. And trading cards, something for me growing up uh, that was unbelievably, you know, I would contest to say I liked trading cards more than I liked toys for a long portion of my life. I grew up with Marvel trading cards. I played Magic the Gathering, you know, for the better part of my life, and I still do to this day. So, you know, cards are so inspiring to me. And, you know, card art uh, that I experienced growing up is really what truly brought me into wanting to be an illustrator. And I did end up being, uh, becoming something a little bit different uh, you know, in the end, but, uh, I love to try to bring that passion into everything that I'm producing and trading cards are something that I need to come with my toy. So I'll have a trading card for each character. And as time goes on, you can build that collection of trading cards. So that's another component. I want this to be a love letter to the things that I love. And if, if you take anything away from today, uh, it should be that you should want to offer that same thing. You know, it should be a love letter to all the things that you love. Whatever it is that you create, whatever it is that you put out into the world, think about how you can bring that thing that has made your life better or enriched you to others. Uh, that's something that I want to put out into the world. Good vibes, right? And to kind of close, it, it, another commercial, and then, you know, we can open it up to any questions that you all have. But these things are so magical. And, you know, this is a funny and... I wouldn't say sad at all, but this is a thing that about me when I'm working on art and, and doing any kind of um, painting, anything like that, I actually like to put on compilations of toy commercials from the 80s. There's something really special about them, the music, the kids, fun little side story. My, my mother actually took me in for a, uh, an audition for two things. It was a commercial for spaghetti, which I blew. Uh, and she took me in for a audition for a Transformers commercial for Devastator. So for the Constructicons, uh, they were doing a commercial where they put the Constructicons together and form Devastator. And she took me in for that. And it was a cast, an open casting call. And I, I blew that one as well. So really sad, but I had a chance. And there's something really special about these. Oh, yeah? Watch this action, Dad. Oh. Now I have the power. He's got a guardian bow 
that the main castle grace got also so that the name of the masters of the universe collection from Mattel. So that's really all that I've got. You know, I love what I do. I love that I've gotten a chance to kind of share the step by step of how I got into this um, and how I've moved through it and kind of gotten to this place in my life. Um, it's been a great experience. I don't plan on slowing down. I only plan on speeding up. Uh, you know, it's like I said, very timely because I just put this up for sale this week uh, and I've already had a great response. I'm already thinking about logistically how I pull this off this month and I can't wait to get started in the studio and, and then finish this and start to move on to my next project. So if you all have any questions, you know, I'm happy to open the floor to those and answer anything that you've got and, and we can kind of go from there. Great presentation, Richard. Um, thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and scroll up real quick. Uh, and see, we did have a couple. Well, first one was for me. Did you design the card backs and the type and all that? Or was that something that they did? So collaborative. So I worked on a portion of it and we kind of did a back and forth. So he did some of it, but uh, Taryn's really good at doing vintage card backs. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I've done as well. Uh, and for my toy, I'll have you know a card back for it. Ultimately, that'll be a release at a point. For starters, I may not do that. Um, it is kind of hard to get the bubble to actually pack them in. So the actual, um, so this portion of it, so, you know, with any toy, the actual, uh, the actual blister of it is relatively hard to come by nowadays, unless you know a, um, a facility that can produce them for you mm -hmm. uh, with a thermovac to actually do that. I think that you might have, I mean, and, and I'm not speaking from experience, but I think you might have that at your fingertips, depending on, what sculpture looks like at SCAD right now. Yeah. Um, there was, there's an instructor here at MTSU named uh, Mark McLeod. And him and I had a really interesting conversation before things became very strange about uh, vacuum forming. Yep. Um, and apparently you can make, you can make your own bubbles, you know, like for the longest time I thought I'd have to like, you know, find these things on eBay or something, but you can actually do it through the process of vacuum forming. And I wouldn't be surprised if the SCAD Sculpture Building had something like that. Yeah. Um, so that's that's very interesting. So let's see. It, it, it is funny that you asked there, that you mentioned that though, because they're actually, and this is that beauty of, you know, uh, being a part of this community. One of the people who has bought from me and been, I would say the biggest supporter of me, uh, he has been big on this, his name's Gary. He actually lives uh, about a mile away from my parents and in just work <laughs> no actually here in georgia so he's oh, up okay. by he lives up around lake lanier and um and he yeah he says he actually works at a facility that does vacuum forming that is what he does for a living so it's that fun thing of you never know who you're going to talk to and it came up in conversation that we were having and he said you know if you ever need that i just kind of work here but i'm happy to introduce you to you know my boss and then that might be something we could do for you someone here said how involved are you this is this question comes from morgan morgan knight how involved are you with the production end of things do you ever work with a middleman so for the production side of it, ultimately, when I start to work with the factory in China, uh, the way that that typically goes is I will provide them with a master sculpt uh, and that will be shipped to them. Uh, they'll take that sculpt uh, that I provide them and there'll be two that they'll get. They'll get the sculpt, so something that they can uh, make a cast from or make a mold from uh, rather, and then uh, they will need a paint, paint master so they'll need a paint master from me because they'll actually be able to paint it in the factory as well. Uh, most factories in China that do collectibles, uh, they'll have two sides. They'll have the production side, so just making molds uh, and casting that, and then they'll have the paint side, so they'll do paint apps. So I'll provide that to them. I'll provide uh, colors, so swatches for them to follow. Uh, so it, it is, in that regard, very hands-on because I'll be a liaison with the factory uh, on the production end, uh, but as far as you know, my studio and what I'm doing now, uh, it's 100% me. Outside of uh, creating the 3D models, everything else is is up to me. So you know, I'm juggling, and you know, happily, and you know, this is maybe surprising to some people. This is something I can very easily balance in my evenings with an eight hour a day, you know, commitment to a salary job. So I'm able to do like that. Is I think very important as context. 
everything that I've done in the past year has happened while I've been working. And let's be honest, it's more like a 10 or 12 hour day. So this is really just a few hours in the evening that I have to dedicate to this and weekends. Uh, and I balance a healthy uh, relationship with a wonderful woman who may or may not be here right now, but, um, but also that. So it's that sort of thing. I can balance my life with this and that's how these things should go. You know, you should be able to balance, you know, your, um, your side gigs with, you know, your careers. It shouldn't affect them in a negative way. I think if anything, it's affected my career in a positive way because I have this kind of context and this sort of perspective and, and information to share now. And this kind of segues into a comment that I made just after this question. Um, I was telling everybody at a time when you were talking about observing, uh, you, when you mentioned the people that are smarter than you, um, you know, I perceive that in many different ways. It could be, you know, people that are, have been in the game longer or just the, the people who are your heroes, you know? Um, and I was just trying to reemphasize re that point that you made earlier about observing people on social media. Um, you know, it's very clear sprinkled throughout your, your talk here that you have quite a bit of heroes and that you watch their business models and you observe those business models and you pull from them what you think is healthy and then you implement them into yours. Um, it seems like, I mean, from slide number one, and I've known you for a bit now, and I know beyond slide number one that this is your passion, that this goes to the roots of your childhood. So I think that in and of itself explains a lot of natural interest for you to observe people in the industry. Um, but in regards to what you said about um, cultivating a healthy schedule, um, so a lot of what you look at will be not because you're on the clock, but because you're interested. But also much of that would be because you're on the clock. So how do you, what are some strategies that you use to balance that time? You know, because clearly you're interested in the stuff, but it's also work as well. So like, how does, are, do you have any strategies for that? Um, Cause that's a, that's a common question I get from undergrads is because life is a lot. Yeah. <laughs> no? so. Oh, it sure is. Yeah. Um, and that's the thing I think, Every now, I remember when when we really when Robin, my my girlfriend and I, really got serious. That was a conversation I had to have with her. I said, you know, I really love what I do, and and she was like, eh, you know, okay, that's good. And I was like, no, no, I don't think you understand. I really love what I do, and <laughs> like I'm I'm really going to be doing this a lot. So if we're sitting and watching TV and I'm drawing, if you know I'm painting and you're in the room with me, I'm not ignoring you. I just love what I do. Like you're here, but this is this is me and. I hate to say that this comes first, but this is my, my first love is my work and my art. So I would say to that, you know, if you have trouble working, you know, on projects or, or on anything, uh, it, and it's because you're losing interest or passion, then you're probably not that invested in it. Run, like run away from that thing that you're doing and mm -hmm. do something new. Keep trying, you know, those different things until something sticks. Uh, I owned a restaurant for a few years. And let me tell you, that's pretty far from making action figures, right? <laughs> so, um, and that, I don't know why I did that. I think I was interested at the time. My dad owned a restaurant growing up um, and there was some sort of strange business nostalgia there for me. But, uh, you know, we all go through phases and my life is a great example of going through those different phases and trying new things. But uh, my short answer to that question, I kind of went, went on an aside there is if you if you have those problems then you need to keep trying new things until you find that thing that you stay passionate about yeah uh, which i will never lose interest in what i'm doing right now mm -hmm. if anything i will just continue down this rabbit hole yeah and i think that's one of the prices that folks pay uh in their quarter life crisis is is that that yeah. idea of not being able to break away from the bad relationship you know uh, in, in many ways, it's it's the thing, it's the very thing that they're studying to be, uh, and that's so that's a really good point. Um, so let's see here. Um, do you have a pref Morgan Knight? Do you have a preference for articulation or no articulation? Would you say that it depends on your market, or that there is an overall preference for one or the other? Great question. So this is this is a super question, and I, I actually um, I think that I actually forgot to include a slide about that. So I'm glad that you asked that. Um, for articulation, um, there are many options. You can go in a lot of different directions with it. Uh, a lot of people, like the nostalgic collectors, 
they're looking for five POA. So five points of articulation. That's, you know, head, arms, legs. And that's very standard. So you think about your He-Man figures, you think about Kenner Star Wars. That's really like, I would say, the, the beginning of articulation. So a lot of people prefer to collect that. So if you're talking from a collectible stance, five points of articulation, it's accessible, it's easy to do. Usually it's peg articulation, uh, it's friction joints. So this is not very hard for somebody to produce. Now, if you get into like, oh, I wanna do like a Marvel Legends figure. So a six inch figure that has, uh, you know, uh, a lot of socket joints, maybe it has ratchets. So it actually has joints that will click uh, and will stay a little bit better. Uh, when you start getting into like 32 points of articulation and that, then you need a factory. Like you can't do that at home uh, unless you are totally insane. And you know, you really wanna spend the time to put those things together as a very difficult. The, uh, the compromise would be something like Revel Tech. So if anybody's familiar with Revel Tech, uh, with Figma figures, uh, they come with a universal joint that um, is just a ratchet, a very small ratchet joint. Uh, that's, it's just a joint, so it's not really a, a ball socket, although they do have ball sockets. Um, uh, they're just ratcheted small joints. You can buy those on eBay in bulk from factories that are selling these things on the side. And I actually legitimately have an order coming in and I have a box full of them that I'm going to be experimenting with pretty soon because that's, you know, again, like a phase 10 of this project is taking this figure that's very basically articulated and more of like a, a piece for the wall or for the shelf uh, and turn that into something you can play with, right? Very, you know, very hands-on, very poseable. That's the end goal, but I'm not there yet. You know, I don't have the finances. I don't have the capability, but I'll build into that. And I would say with articulation, you know, again, like the, the short answer for that is that you need to figure out what your market is for, you know, collectors and dive deeply into that. So if it's five POA that you're trying to create for, then, you know, dive in that direction. Uh, a great articulation system that I'm actually in, in talks with the, um, the copyright holder uh, is Glyos. Uh, so it's G L. Y O S, and it's just a peg. It's a simple peg system. And uh, Matt, who has the copyright of it, you know, he has many different lines of toys under the Glyos uh, name, and they're all cross compatible. So, like I mentioned, there's a lot of fun with toys of, of mixing and matching and Frankensteining. So, Glyos encourages that sort of creativity. So, you can also look at the toy field in that way. Of you know, there's a lot of these sub markets. And there's a lot of these niche sort of collectors within these markets uh, that maybe just collect for the sake of creating their own figures and they want more choices. So, you know, with more creators, that offers more choice. So there's more interest, more investment. And uh, it's a very um, healthy community of people that want to spend money. And I think that's, you know, we always get back to this conversation as artists and creatives that, um, you know, sometimes a, a print something framed on the wall is hard to sell. Uh, now, uh, now, when it comes to a toy, that's a collectible, that's thing, things that people are actively collecting, they want to buy, they're very passionate about buying them. I would say it's very rare to find people who are passionate about buying art for the wall. Uh, so that's where, you know, I love people who can make money um, with sales and be, uh, or be successful selling prints. I know, Tony, you've been successful, you know, with prints and but, you've been smart about it. Like you've but, marketed to specific yeah. fan bases. But you're right, though. I mean, you know, I didn't I didn't even realize to the degree that the fish thing, like the fish prints that I did, uh, how not happy I was. I mean, I was happy that it all worked out and the money worked out. But I started getting photos from people with with just of tubes because they're crazy, right? Like depending on the, the fan base that you're dealing with, you know, like yeah. there are people who tell me they love that they have it, but it's in a tube. They just like never opened it. They never opened it to even see if it was in there. I could have sent them an empty tube. They just were crazy fans enough to just of the band mainly to just have it. They just wanted to have it. There's much more, I think, um, uh, excitement, at least in my opinion, on owning something that you can see in the full round and something that you can move and something that you can, um, it's movable, you know? So I think that's, mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's the, there, there are downsides to the prints. I think that, that prints are, are really, again, you have the diehard collectors in that, in that world as well. 
um, but you only have so much wall space, you know? Um, so that's uh, that's definitely something to think about. So Britt yeah. says here, did you test your price of the toys that you created on a group or vary your prices in the beginning to find the right pricing slash what price your pieces sold at? Hopefully this question makes sense, she says. <laughs> yeah, I, that's, no, I completely understand that question. Um, and to answer it, yes. And, you know, uh, it took some research. You know, I, I, of course, am a collector myself. So I, I know what a price would be or what an acceptable price would be for something uh, based on, you know, how it's produced, the quality of it, you know, whether it's um, a production run of something. So from a factory or it's from a maker, you know, in their home, um, there are very specific kind of prices and trends that you'll see. Uh, so if you're trying to come up with, you know, a price for things, you need to be informed by the market and know, you know, how your product compares to the other offerings within it. So my recommendation with that is to be, you know, doing research all the time and seeing what those trends are. For me, I wanted something a little bit more accessible. So a lot of times I've seen figures similar to what I'm selling go for like 75 to $150 because they're made from a home studio. They're pretty limited runs. They're pretty involved. You know, the hand is in it. Uh, I wanted it to be accessible. So $45 price point. Uh, that is accessible to most people who are collecting and I'll stress collecting because like an average person may not spend $50 on this, but somebody who is a collector, that's very, a very acceptable price for them. Uh, most, you know, finer toys are going to be more than that. You're also including quite a bit too, though. I mean, you got the card and, and two weapons and what else is in the yep. pack? Yeah, there's a lot. It's packed full. So this is that sort of thing where also it's a time that I'm going to be trying to offer more than I typically would, you know, on a, on a normal week. So um, when I start to do production runs and releases in the future, I'm going to be trying my best to be raising the price slowly. Uh, so those that got in early, you know, they're benefiting from that. Whereas those that are getting in a little bit later who had maybe FOMO, you know, they, they weren't sure that they wanted to get it. They didn't get it. They passed. Now it's more expensive. Um, they will then probably jump on board as they see that things go up. Um, and with that being said, you know, it's, it's just a matter of knowing what your profit margin is as well. So like, I know what my materials cost. I know what kind of time goes into the things that I'm doing. Uh, and I can kind of gauge, you know, my prices based off of that as well. I know what resin costs. I know the print time. I know what it takes for me to, um, to paint things. And that's where I would say, I, I got a few messages from people actually, uh, when I released this. And they said, you know, do you feel like you're underpricing yourself with this? And I said, thank you for that. I appreciate that comment. But also, uh, no, like I want this to be something people can get. You know, I don't want this to be this thing that somebody sees and they're like, well, I'd love this, but I can't buy it. You know, I don't have the money for this. Um, and in an interesting turn of events, you know, with the stimulus checks going out to people, I think that may have influenced purchases as well because some people got, you know, an extra $1,200 in their bank accounts and uh, they have this extra spending cash. So thinking about that as well, like you, these are all these little things that you learn over the years. Mm -hmm. You want to try to time releases and things with when people are getting paid. So usually on a Friday, it makes sense to do a release of something because people's paychecks are usually there. So on a Friday, you know, uh, twice a month, most people are like, I want to spend some money. Like I've been itching to spend some money that I don't have. So, um, so you want to time things like that and be smart about and aware of, you know, maybe a Wednesday doesn't make a whole lot of sense to sell something. Um, you know, maybe it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to try to sell something at three in the morning. You know, you, you want to try to time things with how people's lives work. Um, so that, I know that was a little, a lot of extra for that question, but I think that answers kind of the, the price point that, yeah, I mean that that's something we can talk about all day, Britt. Um it's a uh, it and it wasn't something that I really learned in school. It was just like what Richard said, it just kind of like starts to unfold as you're making decisions and as you're paying the rent and as you're kind of financially responsible for yourself. You know, um it, it's something that I discuss with my wife all the time, you know, like when we're going to buy product, when we're not going to buy product. Um, you know, typically if I'm working with a third party or something like that. I try to make sure that they're local, that they're that they're not, you know, these big conglomerates that I can't have relationships with. That's really important. 
Um, but that's definitely something we can chat about for sure in class. Um, so it looks like uh, Morgan Knight says, are there a lot of options for eco-conscious packaging or is that hard to come by? Oh, good question. Um, this is one of those ones that's going to stump me a little bit. Uh, with what I'm getting right now because of the way that things are for me um, with finances and just starting this kind of endeavor, uh, I'm looking for the cheapest materials to ship with. Um, that's something, you know, for anybody who's starting a business, you don't want to be bleeding money into your packaging. Uh, that's a difficult thing to do. So for me, like I try to limit what I'm using and try to reuse things that I have around the house when I can. Uh, so packing paper has worked very well. Um, you know, like I said, I use uh, bubble wrap for all of my packages to make sure that, you know, since they're made of resin, they're, they're somewhat fragile, uh, that they're not damaged when they arrive. Uh, and with poly mailers, I was seeing that getting a bubble mailer was far too expensive, like when you scale it up. Um, usually with my packages, uh, shipping something costs about $5. So it's usually about between a dollar, $1.50 and $3 to ship it, so postage. And then it's usually an additional uh, $1.50 to $2.50 or $3. Uh, for the packaging for it when you think about everything that's going into that. So in the end, me having a flat fee of like $5 for shipping, that might be something that I need to change as time goes on. And that is another thing that for anybody starting a business where you're shipping a product, uh, you want to make sure that you're really considerate of not losing money on uh, shipping and packaging. That can be something that very quickly you're, you're not tracking and then you realize oh like i'm spending an extra you know hundred dollars like i'm actually losing a hundred dollars on every you know order that i'm sending out uh, or every batch that i'm sending out because i'm spending so much on um, on bubble mailers and this and that so going to target or walmart or whatever store to buy these things i wouldn't recommend uh shop around on uh you know on amazon is a good option of course uh, but then also just shopping around the internet to see who may offer the best bulk option for getting shipping materials, get those, have them as a stock, and then work from that. You know, I have probably uh, 200 or 300 poly mailers. Um, I've got a few rolls of bubble wrap uh, that I've ordered as well as packing paper. And then boxes I have, you know, for days. So these are things that I've stocked up on because it does make more sense when you're getting into a business that you want to keep like this to buy in bulk rather than like, I'm gonna get 20 at a time. I got, you know, 500 at a time because I'm then saving, you know, 70 or more dollars that I'm ultimately gonna spend. So it's it's a matter of, do you wanna, like, do you have the capital to do it now or do you wanna kind of build that capital so you can? And that's where, you know, sales can go back into, you know, cheaper operations for you. So when you do make $500 on a project, then some of that can go immediately back into your supplies. And that's how every business should run. You know, a lot of the money that you're making should go straight back into the business to sustain it. Yep. One of the bigger mistakes I made at the beginning of my career is taking everybody out for dinner, oh. not, not budgeting for the next one, not, not thinking about the supplies I needed. So very good point. Yeah. You want to be nice, you know, and, and that's the thing, you know, I want cool packaging for people, but getting a, you know, a blister, card that's sealed like that's that's then opening pandora's box so i need a printer that can actually do card backs i need somebody to custom vacuum form a, a blister and then produce that and with most of these things there's a startup fee so you're having to pay them just to even do the project and then you're paying for the project itself so with a vacuum form it might be six hundred dollars just to make the bubble and to you or i that's a very easy thing to do theoretically but then when you bring it to a factory that's used to doing orders of a million, and then you're saying, I need a hundred, they're saying, well, we don't really do this to begin with. So, you know, then you have to think about alternatives and, you know, working, staying in your lane as a, let's say a smaller uh, producer of something or a small business, you have access to things that a small business would have. So a lot of what you're going to come up with as solutions are going to be innovations that you make in your studio space. So, you know, can I print card backs on my printer? The answer is yes, and I've done that. Uh, so that's something I might do, 
but I'll do it in very limited runs because it's not very effective use of time or of my printer. So, you know, I may do that as a one-off, as a two-off, but, you know, you can find solutions and innovation within constraints. I think it's great when you don't have access to everything because then you have to have to come up with solutions. You're forced into it. So out of necessity, you're trying to figure out, well, how do I do this packaging? And you will always come up with an idea if, you are, uh, if your hand is forced in those cases. Good answer. Sherry had had a 1979 Boba Fett. He was pretty cool looking. Oh yeah, he's a. Uh... That's not the one with the with the. So, this is a. Uh... Yep, that's the 1979 Boba. This isn't and... the one that has the 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 pack that shoots the dart that you say well, it's like. None of them do. That's the white whale. So uh, the okay, people that have that prototype, but. Um, fun story with him, uh, for The Force Awakens, when The Force Awakens came out, uh, I actually was in LA when The Force Awakens came out. I saw it opening uh, day in uh, the Chinese theater, and I actually brought him with me. So he went to see the premiere of The Force Awakens. <laughs> awesome. Didn't you say you saw somebody buy one of those Boba Fett mm -hmm. with yeah. What was, what was the, the exchange? Uh, it was 2007, no, 2011 New York Comic Con. I saw somebody buy one of the prototypes that was known of the 79 uh, Boba Fett, and he spent, I think it was $27,000 on it. And it was because the, the toy was discontinued because of the choking hazard? Well, it never went into production. Yeah, and, oh, and, that's, okay. and that's where, you know, this is the fun thing about like toy history. And, and it never went into production because um, uh, Battlestar, it was Battlestar Galactica toys uh, had come out that year. And a child had actually shot one of the missiles from a vehicle into his throat and died. So there he choked go. to death on that. And when that happened, Kenner was already in production of this toy. So they were starting to produce it. They had to halt production. Uh, and they stopped factories and then as an alternative, they glued all the missiles in and they removed the firing mechanism. So if you have one of these, you'll see that the missiles glued in there, but there's no way to fire the mechanism. Uh, so there are some, there's two different prototypes. One is I believe called the J, the J hook firing mechanism. And I'm forgetting what the other one is, but uh, they still have the firing mechanism intact but they they there are only a handful that are known to exist in the world and they are they are under lock and key so um <laughs> so it's a really cool thing but you know that, that's part of the fun i think that's why people are so passionate about toys you know you, they have these stories and and this toy specifically has a lot of cool stories around it there's also a really fun one that's sort of like an urban legend is wonder bread he-man and this is like a total myth uh, and nobody has been able really to prove it because records were all pen and paper back then. But apparently there was a promotion that Wonder Bread did uh, where you could mail in proofs of purchase from Wonder Bread and get a Wonder Bread version of He-Man that had the colorways of a Conan figure that it was based off of uh, because there was a whole copyright uh, lawsuit that went on from, um, from the estate of Robert E. Howard uh, because they thought that uh, He-Man was derivative of Conan the Barbarian and some toys were coming out around then that looked like Conan. So this colorway, this paint job was similar to like Schwarzenegger's interpretation or his representation of, uh, of Conan the Barbarian on film. So there's all these cool things. All, and if you dig into, you know, toys and toy history, it's a lot of fun. And, I'm seeing uh, it now, yeah. yeah. That's crazy. Yep. So... Okay, so then we have Manny says that he loves small soldiers. Have yeah. you collaborated or thought about animating your figures once yeah. you build the universe for it? It's a good question. So I got the comics. Uh, those are you know in the in the oven, as it were. And um, uh, it's interesting because I look at how I can get a lot of um, uh, distance from the things that I'm creating. So with Frank, he delivered a 3D model to me, right? So what can I do with that 3D model? I can hire a rigger, I can hire, hire an animator, and then I can turn that into something that can move on screen. So uh, a next step is to try to take the 3D model that he provided me uh, and bring that into an animated form so that there is something a little extra. 
even if that's just used for promotion, I'm happy with it. But I really want to um, to take that 3D model and 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 run with it. Uh, I do have, and this is a friend of mine from undergrad. Again, a good reason to stay friends with your friends that you go to school with. Uh, he works in New York as a uh, as a motion designer, and he loves the project. He's always been a huge supporter of me and what I do. And he wants to do some motion work with the comics that I'm creating. So I'm going to give him the comics, and this will be another contract with him. But he wants to animate these comics. So a lot of cool things that you can bring from it, and these are the assets. You know, so if you work on a project similar to this. Think about how you can use the assets in new ways, so that you get more distance out of them, and they can do more for you. You know, it's great that I got the 3D model, but you know, I can do more than just make a toy out of it. That's something that's animatable, so I can really build out a universe with that. I've always wanted to see your stuff like as a TV show, like with yeah, commercial breaks <laughs> and and great voice acting. Um, it, 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 the colorways, I mean, the shape language of it, it all lends to that. I loved, I had no idea about the origins of Memphis, by the way. Like I didn't, mm -hmm. maybe you had mentioned it somewhere, but like that Saved by the Bell, it, it like yep. makes so much sense to me now. Um, like what a great, what a great little origin story for a character. And that's the fun thing with like creating lore for your universe. Uh, on comic panels, you'll see that there's some things that he'll, he will speak and then some things that are symbols. So he'll have word bubbles where symbols are used. Mm -hmm. Those would be uh, iconography that the Memphis school would use. Yeah. So, um, so it's Memphis's language that he can have internal dialogue and speak to himself. But these would be essentially this is like speaking in tongues, but mm -hmm. for him. So, um, so this is that kind of fun thing where you get to play with it. And, you know, when people find out about that, then they're like, I'm in the know, you know, this is cool. I know why he uses these symbols. Yeah. And that's what, you know, I try to encourage with other, you know, anybody, any creator, you have to think about these fun little inside jokes that might just look cool to somebody that doesn't know. But yeah. then when you dig a little deeper, there's actually logic behind yeah. it. And then before you know it, you as the creator get overpassed by the fandom. You know, yes. where, where yeah. people can speak speak yeah. Klingon, and you don't even know like what it is. Like they know more about Memphis than you do, mm -hmm. and that's exciting. So, um, good question, Manny. It's one that I'm thoroughly interested in as well. I'd love to see that stuff move. Um, Morgan Knight, do you know anyone who works in the commercial toy industry? Do you have any opinions on the state of that right now? Do you think that things like video games, internet access are going to affect the commercial toy industry? Good question. You got, you all have good questions today. Um, so one thing comes to mind that's really cool, and this is again, very timely. Like toys are something that's it's always changing. The collectibles industry is always changing. If, if you all follow the toy industry at all, you may have seen that Todd McFarlane, so Image Comics, uh, you know, the creator of Spawn, uh, he actually just launched a Kickstarter about a week or so ago. I think it was just a week ago uh, to remaster his first version of Spawn. And um, and that Kickstarter, I want to say, I haven't checked in on it this week, but I think that it's at like $1.7 million or somewhere a little under that. Uh, he, it was funded in just a few minutes. I think in less than 30 minutes, he had reached a million dollars, which was the goal. Uh, and he has far surpassed that at this point. Um, you know, there is that kind of model of bringing a toy to Kickstarter for commercial companies. It, this wouldn't really work for, not in the same scale for somebody smaller, but for somebody like Todd McFarlane, who has, you know, a publishing company, a very successful toy company. He's done a lot of really successful licensing. Um, and he's really in the past, I would say two years, really innovated the toy industry again. Uh, for anybody who was that age, so for myself, uh, Tony, I see Doug is in here. I think Doug may have been in that in this kind of range as well. But um, you know, Todd Toys, and when Todd McFarlane came onto the scene with his toys, that really upped the game for what an action figure was. Uh, so Spawn, as a line of toys, really pushed the rest of the industry forward. And now we're seeing, I think, uh, McFarlane Toys push the industry again with some of the licensing that he's doing. Uh, he's gotten some anime licenses. I never thought I would see Todd McFarlane make a One Punch uh, action figure or a My Hero Academia action figure. But here we are, you know, we're at this place in the world uh, and they're fantastic toys. Uh, he's doing a new DC, he got the DC license. Uh, 
Uh, just this year, uh, actually just a few months ago, a toy started to release. They are fantastic. Uh, he has game licenses, so uh, McFarland Toys produces Fortnite uh, toys, which of course Fortnite is a cash cow for toys with all of the different skins and costumes uh, that you have access to there. They have created themselves, you know, um, you know, just infinite money through the characters that they're introducing to that game. So you see companies like McFarland really adapting well. Uh, companies like Hasbro and Mattel, you actually see them getting more in touch with how they operated years ago. So I think that there has been really, a, um, that industry has reignited itself. And with Hasbro, they've done a good job um, bringing Transformers back into the forefront with quality toys that people want that are nostalgic, but then also innovative. They're toys that people want. And that, that's what I really want to stress. Uh, for many years, Transformers was, I think, a lost cause. Uh, but now they've really gotten back in touch with themselves. They're offering things that fans, fans want, not investors, not the quarterly, you know, investors, the fans. Uh, so that really is represented in their work. Hasbro is doing a good job with their Marvel license. So all of the uh, action figures that you see in Marvel Legends, uh, they've been continuously uh, moving forward, I think, with that line. So you see Hasbro doing well um, with on that side, very commercial, but then also Hasbro has gotten wise to crowdfunding and you know they're looking at HasLab as a, as a way for them to fund projects that otherwise wouldn't be fundable. So we had, I think the first project they did was, was Jabba's Skiff from Star Wars. And um, Jabba, or Jabba's Skiff was, I wanna say it was between three and $400. Um, it was a big project, a limited run, you know, it was only for the people that bought it. So there was no commercial release for it. Uh, they've done, I think, a full-scale Cookie Monster. So they've done some Muppets that are essentially, it's that character to that quality. Uh, and then the really big one that they didn't get to the to the mark for uh, was Unicron. So anybody that knows Transformers knows that Unicron is literally a planet that transforms into a robot and eats other planets. Huge Transformer, colossal undertaking, and they put the uh, price at 600 and I think $75. And it was like $130 shipping. So right out of the gate, you were spending $750 for this thing. It didn't get funded. It came relatively close, but um, you see companies experimenting, which is good because that tells you that they're innovating, they're testing the market and they're seeing what will and won't work and they're adjusting. Uh, so Hasbro is looking more at like the diehard collector. How can we offer them more specific things that there's interest in, but, um, and people will buy the second that they have it as an option. Uh, that uh, this is a little bit more than a commercial release, something you can go to Walmart or Target. Uh, Mattel, as the kind of the last big player in the commercial toy business, uh, they finally, after many years of not doing anything with it, they've finally gone back to basics with uh, Masters of the Universe and E-Man. And uh, this year we'll see a release, uh, a big box store, so Target and Walmart, we will see He-Man figures again. And that's gonna line up with the release of, um, you know, Kevin Smith's version of Masters of the Universe, the limited series on Netflix, as well as the animated, like the CG uh, continuation of the He-Man story on Netflix as well. So you see these old properties coming back and because these were toy properties, you see these companies finally getting back to basics and offering something that people want. You know, I think this is something that's always said in the toy industry, you know, the collectors uh, that exist in the world now, they have money, you know, they're, they're now grown up, they now have money, they want to spend it. So, you know, anybody who started to collect as a kid in the 80s or 90s, we're in careers, we have families, we have a bank account, we want to continue to buy these things. And many of us, I know Tony's guilty of this as well, we're trying to recollect the things from our childhood. So, you know, we're going out and trying to find those things that we may have lost or we may have sold and put them back into our collections. So it's a lot of reclaiming, you know, that piece of childhood that you're missing. And that's what, you know, many toy makers and, and designers are trying to tap into. And we see that happening on a commercial scale as well right now. Um, so personally, I don't know very many people. I know some individuals that have done some card art for, um, for Transformers, uh, for Hasbro. A lot of them work in-house and it's, they're in, uh, based in different states. So I've had the fortune of, of uh, communicating with um, some of their design teams through my day job. And they're a great bunch of people. And you know, if you can get onto those teams, it's a fantastic thing, but they want somebody with a kitchen sink of skills to go into those roles. You, know, you need to do it all. 
so it's a little bit of everything to get into that industry. And it's a good place to start is on a small scale, you know, like what I'm doing or what any other maker is doing out of their own home studio. That's your proof of concept to these companies. You know, I have produced my own toy. I have worked with a factory in China. I have done these things that immediately qualifies you for these roles far above, you know, anybody who's going to them saying, well, I know how to do 3D modeling. Like I know how to use ZBrush, but you don't know the business of it. You might not have that uh, be something that you're fluent in yet. Um, with like video games and internet access, um, how is that affecting it? The, the, the biggest way that it's affected it is that the quality of toys has had to increase and the price has had to increase. So toys are marketing more to, you know, that specific uh, demographic that has the money for it uh, and wants something specific. Uh, so that's where I would say, you know, I think that it's affected in a positive way. It's just had to adjust and become a bit smaller of a scale. You know, long gone are the days of, you know, our childhoods where a toy was, you know, $5 or $7. Uh, you could get something really cheap toys are 20 bucks now you know that's usually what you're seeing you know at a store so the market definitely has gotten smaller but uh, the market also has adapted and now through social media uh, through promotion they understand how to connect with those individuals uh, that do want these things so I think that the market is more accessible it's not the same as you know a kid going to the mall and then saying you know going to KB Toys and having you know you get into a fight with your parents over getting a toy that might not happen as much anymore but through Amazon through delivery um, and through everything else there's a lot of great resources that have allowed it to continue and I think flourish uh, I think the past five years are a really good sign that's a healthy market and a healthy industry and it's going to continue to be healthy we're on that nostalgia kick you know, and we always will be. And, you know, the, the I don't think times will change in that way. We'll always be nostalgic of the 80s and the 90s. Uh, that's something that many people, many experts in culture uh, would say that, you know, the 80s and 90s, that was it. You know, past that, we don't really have an identity for the anything past, you know, 2000. There's not really something that identifies that or separates it, not in a way that we notice yet. Uh, so the 80s and 90s are still where it's at. And that's where all the toys are from. So that's a good and, place to be. And, and that's, those are really good points, Richard. I mean, for, for the longest time, I thought, you know, um, that it was just us, you know, and that we were the ones yearning for, you know, to reclaim our childhood or to buy the records or the tapes and all that. Um, but I've even noticed, you know, my students feel the same way because in a lot of ways, even though they weren't a part of that time, it doesn't change the fact that they want to own their own copy of something. I think that whether or not you were born into streaming or not born into streaming streaming does something to you that doesn't feel like it uh, doesn't feel like it's your own thing it's everybody's thing it's a digital mm -hmm. you know a uh, file that you're seeing you know but uh, i've even you know i've seen many of my students particularly at mtsu who covet their things the things that they love and and you above all people understand that you know like the dings and dents that your toy can have from being in battle or from being through mm -hmm. what you've been through are special things. It, it helps it to become more your thing uh, rather than something that somebody can download and use um, multiple times. So I think there's there's that in addition to the the nostalgia for the 80s and 90s that and that's one of the reasons I don't think this will ever die um, because you know even my son now who has no clue about what's going on. Um, I think that he'll he'll very much so enjoy owning his own copy of something as soon as somebody can experience what that is, you know, regardless of when you were born. I think that it's it's something that that you will continue continually yearn for. And that's why I think this this will never die. Um, so, yeah, great, great points. Um, got to have the. Oh, yes. Got to have the mandatory advice for graduates question. So that that is, of course. Oh, I know. see what you mean. Yeah. Right. And <laughs> okay. Any yeah, any presentation wouldn't yeah. be complete. Yeah. Without that question, um, so my my advice, and this is very, I would say, personal, but also professional, uh, would be that you're at a place in your probably in your education in your lives where you're trying to find where your passion and profession meet, and you may not really know what your profession is yet, and you may not really know what your passion is yet. So those are things that you need to continue to chase. And that means that you need to experiment. 
that means you need to explore, that means you need to be curious. Uh, so that's my first bit of advice. Stay curious and keep searching because when you find it, like I said earlier uh, in my presentation, when you find that thing that really lights you up and really uh, moves you forward, you will know it. And at that point you will probably stop and you will continue doing it. So that's my first big part of advice. My second big bit of advice is that we are not a result of ourselves. We are a result of everybody else in our lives. So that being said, it should be another quest of yours to interact with everybody you can and to create those genuine lasting relationships uh, so that it can lead to more opportunities for you. Uh, it can lead to more access to things, whether it's an industry, a factory, a this or that. You know, it's the people that you know that lead to those things. So if you are that person that really walls yourself off and wants to do it alone, you won't go as far as you could with others. Uh, you know, it's so important. And it's such a hard thing nowadays to, I think, embrace uh, because we do very much. Even, even this time is a good example of it. You know, we're social distancing, we're staying home, but we can still interact and engage with people online. So have those genuine conversations uh, don't ever assume that somebody doesn't want to talk to you. Uh, please don't do that. that. That's something I see all the time from, from the students I work with as well, uh, is, well, you know, why would they want to talk to me? You know, I'm just a student at a place doing a thing. They're this person. They would never want to have this conversation. You will be surprised. You know, give yourself a chance. Try to start those conversations. Ask those questions that, you know, are burning in, you know, in your heart or in your mind. Uh, and see if those answers come back to you. And don't be discouraged when you don't hear back. Continue to get those out there to new people. Because if one person didn't send a response back, that doesn't mean everybody else won't. That just means that person may have been busy, that person may have been a jerk, I don't know what it is. But you wanna make sure you give yourself the chance to get those answers you're looking for. So keep doing that, and if you do, you'll find good people, you'll find people that wanna help you, and you'll find people that wanna see you successful. You know, I'm really thankful that I had a chance to meet Tony and you know have a relationship with him. You know, we've had great conversations over the years. It's been amazing getting to see him become a father. You know, congratulations still on that. It's so crazy uh, to see that 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 kid is now running around. Um, you know, you never think that these things will happen, but I'm so happy that it did, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. Um, and that was just serendipitous. Like it just it happened. You know, and you have to give these things a chance. So. You know, let relationships happen whenever you can and maintain them. You know, I could have said bye, Tony, you know, when he moved up to, to Tennessee, but um, but no, I'm not going to do that. I want to stay friends with Tony. So don't be that friend that, you know, never reaches out. Uh, be that friend that starts conversations with people that you haven't spoken with in a while because you never know. You really don't know where they'll end up and what they'll be able to offer you and, you know, what that means to them because it does mean a lot to check in. You know, and that's something I found over the years, you know, I really appreciate and want to return the favor to those people that just called me or texted me just to say like, hey man, like, how are you? You know, what's going on with you? Uh, be that force that keeps people connected. Uh, don't just step away from it all. Yep. And make cool stuff. Last bit of advice is make cool stuff. You know, you gotta make cool stuff. Uh, yep. So whatever it is that you do, do it and make it cool. And to add on to what Richard's saying in regards to the advice for graduates, commit yourself to that act of service, whatever that act of service may be. You know, I don't brush my teeth now because I think that they're gonna fall out tomorrow. You know, I commit myself to that act of service every day, just as I do to my illustration work. So that would be what I would piggyback on, you know, what Richard is saying is hold yourself accountable and actually ask yourself, what did you do this week for the thing that you really want? You know what I mean? Um, and be honest with yourself about it. Um, because it's not easy. It's it, it sounds a lot easier than it is to pursue the thing that you're passionate about. That's why I have a, when I get questions like, "When did you become an illustrator?" They're always it's always such a strange question to answer. It's like, well, I don't know. You know, like maybe when I was first published. You know, but I remember feeling that feeling of like, okay, maybe this is only going to happen one time. You know, so it's 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 a it's a at some point you just become the thing that you're that you're most interested in, the the thing that you chase after the most. Um, but you know, as Richard has mentioned numerous times, it's very easy to to let those dreams fall by the wayside. So I mean, I'm really proud of you, man. 
Um, Thank you. It's, it's unfortunate that it's all too rare that someone declares a goal and then meets that goal and mm -hmm. beyond. Um, I'm like, I feel like proud to just have been in the car with you when you declared this to me. Um, I, yeah, I was about to say, you know, I think that that was, that was a conversation we had before this all happened. And, and that's, that should be a testament to everybody that's still, you know, here and, and, and listening to this is that when you say you're going to do something, do it. I mean, you know, th there's no reason that you shouldn't. If you say that you're going to make something happen, you need to make it happen. And it, it might take some time, but you need to follow through with everything that you set yourself to. Uh, you know, if you say you're going to learn ZBrush, learn it. If you say you're going to make a toy, make it. You know, I had a few things that kind of halted me in this process, but I always got back on the horse with it and I, you know, came back to it. So, you know, that's integrity and that's something that is rare nowadays. We get a lot of people who are all talk and no walk. You know, it's like, well, I'm going to do this thing. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to go on a diet. I mean, that's the most common one. You know, I'm going to go on a diet. I'm going to change my body, you know, summer bod. And you get to the summer and it's like, well, you're still winter bod, you know, and that's every year for people. It's perpetual. Uh, it's, it's those people that say that I'm going to go through a body transformation at the end of the year. It's like, I've lost 50 pounds. My life has changed. Everything else is better. Um, you want to be that person, right? And I don't want to use like fitness as a, as a specific example, but it is a good example. A lot of times, uh, in parallel with an artist you know, and commitment, you know, you really need to train yourself. You really need to commit to what you're doing and follow through. And the, the more you follow through and the more people see that you follow through, they know that you are a person that will finish the job, whatever that may be. And that will lead to more work. Most common thing I see from students that I work with is that they do not finish things on time. Uh, and these are real projects with real people. Guess what? When you don't finish something on time for somebody, they probably aren't going to want to bring you back on because they see that that is the most important thing for them because you are not accommodating their schedule for releasing something or for finishing something. So th the more you give people examples of you following through and following through on time, you will go that much further in life because you may not be the best at something. That's true of many of us. I would not say I'm the best at really anything. But I would like to say that when I say that I'm going to do something, I do it. Um, I follow through and people see that I do that. So that people know they can count on me. I don't do a great job sometimes. I do a very good job all the time. I, I'll, I'll take that any day of the week. Um, you know, and sometimes I'll knock it out of the park, but doing a good job uh, most of the time and getting it in on time, that's a huge testament to you as a, as a person and also as a business person, professional. Thank you so much, Richard. Any other last minute questions before we we, uh, we call it a day? Well, this was awesome. I just purchased my Striker Memphis. I saw, I was gonna thank you during, I have my phone right next to me and I was like, Tony Rodriguez. So Who's that thank guy? you, Tony. I cannot wait to get him and to, to shelve him with my other, with the rest of my army. We'll, we'll discuss the custom paint job and we'll discuss uh, delivery. I thank think you. that I need to drive it up to you. Folks are saying thank you for your time. And yes, I thank you as well. And thank you all, all for your time. Yeah. You, you all know, stay you safe. And um, yes, thank you so much. And enjoy your weekend. Britt says thank you. Morgan says thank you so much for your time. Um, and uh, stay motivated. Amanda says hello. She's giving me a big wave to you. Uh, hey, Amanda. Yeah. So um, have a good one, y'all. Enjoy the weekend. Take care. Stay safe.